Hello, it's Regina. Welcome back to my haunted library. Today I'm continuing with another story chapter by Robert McKee and uh, I'm now on chapter 14, The Principle of Antagonism. Slowly working my way through this, I have a whole playlist uh, devoted to this book, which uh, you can check out if you want to look at the other ones. I'm also happy to report that I signed up for Robert McKee's story seminar for the fall, so I'm going to actually get to meet the master. Something I've always wanted to do, and neither of us are getting any younger, so I figured why not do it, because he was coming to New York with a genre seminar. So of course, I signed up for the horror one. So this is going to be a day of intensive study devoted to writing horror in screenplays and television. And we have a little homework assignment that I will start working on, and I'm very excited. And of course, I will do a whole video about that experience and report back to you guys about what I learned. So uh, here we go. I found this chapter to be interesting. This is uh, The Principles of Antagonism. Right off the bat, he says, in my experience, the principle of antagonism is the most important and least understood precept in story design. Neglect of this fundamental concept is the primary reason screenplays and the films made from them fail. The principle of antagonism. So this is the in bold type. A protagonist and his story can only be as intellectually fascinating and emotionally compelling as the forces of antagonism make them. So he writes a lot about how defining your protagonist in terms of the opposition against him or her and how what he does or she does to overcome those. That's how you develop the character, which I think is a very interesting way of putting it. So he said, don't try to make your character likable. Show his or her values as a human being through the, what, how they deal with the antagonism. Now, an antagonism can be like a person. It could be uh, a very kind of one monster after a hero type of thing. Like you have the Terminator or the shark in Jaws. You have this relentless monster coming down uh, from outer space or through the ocean to kill and, and that's their only purpose. And so the antagonist is fighting against that. Or it can be a whole other host of things. It could be environmental. It could be the societal. It could be inner conflict. So the antagonism can be like a war with oneself. So all of these different things. But he makes the point in this that you want to... He says, taking story and character to the end of the line. So you want to explore that antagonism to its most extreme degree whether that is um, in, in a battle or in like a battle with the self. He calls it the negation of the negation, meaning taking something to the nth degree. He uses this story a lot, which is, is a good example. Ordinary People, very good movie. And I've read the book too. Some of uh, you younger folks might not know this film, which is a shame. You should check it out because it's, it's really good. It's about... a. Uh, a teenage boy who uh, loses his brother in a tragic accident. His brother drowns. He survives. And he has survivor's guilt and tries to kill himself. And the story begins with him in his, this very upper, like middle class suburban white family where uh, Donald Sutherland plays the father and Mary Tyler Moore plays the mother. And um, Timothy Hutton plays the son. And they're ordinary people. They're like the American ideal fam, suburban family. He talks about that movie that the antagonist on the surface is the mother. Because Mary Tyler Moore plays this really horrible mother who hates her son. Like she really d hates her son. But she won't admit it because, you know, nice people don't hate their children. You know, she's, she's completely blind to her own uh, issues. And she blames her son for the death of her favorite, like the favorite, the golden child died in the accident and the one she really didn't like survived. And she resents him and despises him for this. And the son feels it, but because they're this, um, you know, perfect family, you can't show this stuff on the surface. So there's, there's, she's an antagonist, but the bigger one, and he cites this in this book, is uh, Conrad, that's the name of the teenage boy that Timothy Hutton plays, is his own self-loathing that caused him to try to kill himself that continues he's continually like trying to destroy himself because he hates himself for surviving 
and he can't forgive himself for doing that. And the mother is part of that an antagonism, but it's his own struggle with the internal self-hatred because she hates him and because he survived and blames himself um, is his real is really what he has to struggle against. So I guess is what McKee is saying is go deep, you know, go deep, find uh, those deeper minds of, of antagonism beyond just the surface. And then you, we will, your character will be well-developed. Your antagonist and your protagonist will be well-developed. People will care because they'll see that noble struggle or whatever the struggle is. He reiterates a lot in this chapter that, a lot of the best kinds of antagonism come from like an internal struggle. And I think that's really true. If when you're creating your character, it makes it much more interesting and you, your character becomes more likable when there is something that they are fighting within themselves. So this kind of came up recently when I was thinking about this book, Twilight by Stephanie Meyer, because I had read that just recently. And I was watching a YouTube video where a woman, young woman, booktuber, and I forget her name, but was discussing this, like the whole YA discussion about should books be uh, problematic books be called out and canceled because of the problematic uh, material, this type of thing. So I thought this was interesting. She mentioned Twilight by Stephanie Meyer saying that, well, if, if we had been doing this kind of culling of the problematic uh, YA books, something like Twilight would have the problematic aspects of Twilight would have, uh, you know, been, I guess, eradicated. I don't know. But I just really had to laugh because I'm like, if you're talking about the fact that uh, Edward is this like controlling lover, and if that's the problematic part of it, I would argue that people wouldn't have been interested in reading that book if it hadn't been for that part of it, at least as one aspect. Because the the conflict and the antagonist, the antagonism in that story was not only, I mean, the overall thing was I'm in love with a vampire, right? So that's the antagonistic forces. What do I do? Oh my God, I'm in love with a vampire. So yes, he's a controlling boyfriend, but it's like, it's done out of love. And the problematic part of it is like, well, love, love shouldn't be destructive and, and love, love is gentle. Love is kind. Well, people don't want to read a book like that because it's boring, you know? We want to see how is she going to solve this problem that she's in love with a vampire? Is she going to let him turn her into a vampire and then she will become immortal like he is, but, uh, you know, she's going to be a vampire or is she going to try to stay with him and he stays 17 forever and she just ages and, uh, you know, it's, it's how's that going to work out? Or is she going to leave him and get away from him because this is this is a destructive relationship? So all of these things and her own internal uh, conflict about that because she loves him. So all of those mechanisms of antagonism create a really great conflict in that story. And that's why that story and was so popular. If you had taken out the uh, controlling boyfriend aspect of it, I don't think anyone would want to read that book. They wouldn't find it interesting. So when I listen to some of these discussions about like problematic books, I just, I just feel like it's a weird way of looking at it. Um, I mean, you take a book like Goethe's Sorrows of Young Goethe back in the 1700s, uh, whenever that book was written, there, it's a tragic story about a lover who kills himself. Now, if because of that book, it was so popular and it was really the beginning of romanticism, but there were a lot of copycat uh, suicides because of that book. Like they, not saying the book made them kill themselves, but they read the book they, and they were so distraught or the, the, it, it moved them in such a way that some people did kill themselves. Now, should we say that that book shouldn't have been printed because some unstable people took it to that degree? I think it's a really interesting discussion. And I was thinking about that as I, um, and, and about Twilight in particular, because I had just seen this uh, uh, YouTube video about talking about how that book should have been, I guess the censored, or not censored is the word, but cleaned of its uh, problematic uh, aspects, which was like a huge part of the antagonism in the book. 
I don't believe in doing that in books. I think books uh, should be allowed to be put out there and people can read them and have, they can not like them. They can have discussions, arguments, whatever. But this idea that we shouldn't have a book out because it's problematic to me is a problem. And I have a feeling McKee would agree with me. And when I go to the seminar and I get a chance to speak to him, I think I might ask him that question about what he thinks of that whole thing. Anyway, let me know what you think. And if you are reading this and if it's helped you in your writing. So I'd love to hear from you. So that's all I have for today. I will continue reading this book and I will post my new video uh, on the playlist whenever I get around to it. But hopefully I will have it all complete. I do plan to finish it before I take that seminar and I'll bring the book with me and maybe I'll get McKee to sign it. So uh, that's all I have for today. Thanks for stopping by my haunted library and I'll see you soon. Bye.